Washington, D.C. is a unique and well-planned city. The parks and avenues all frame the iconic buildings that make up the nation's capital. But as you drive past the Capitol building and down East Capitol Street, you end up at another prominent and massive structure. Except this one is abandoned. It's the RFK Stadium, and ever since the early 1960s, it's been a major fixture in Washington. A structure that began a trend for many modern stadiums to come. But it's been years since any major event, and the whole stadium has seen a palpable decline for decades. Its eventual permanent closure ultimately left a 56,000 seat stadium abandoned less than two miles from some of the most iconic and photographed buildings on the continent. What's up guys, my name is Jake, and in this 80th episode of Abandoned, let's find out how a prominent and historic stadium like this has been sitting abandoned in America's capital. This episode is sponsored by Skillshare. The first 1,000 people to use my special link in the description below will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare. The idea of a large stadium in the nation's capital began all the way back in the early 1900s. It wouldn't be explored seriously until the mid-1920s, when a 100,000-seat mega-stadium was proposed. At the time, that would have been an unbelievable number of seats to pack into such a facility. It was proposed as a project that could serve various uses and attract the Olympics for Washington, D.C. It could also be the perfect venue for massive events like presidential inaugurations. Ultimately, this never made it past Congress. Years would pass until 1954, when yet another stadium was proposed, this time by Congressman Charles Howell. He proposed legislation to build a large sports facility. And this time, it actually made it through Congress. It did so as a scaled-down version of the original concept, and slated to be constructed east of the U.S. Capitol building. President Eisenhower signed off on this 50,000-seat stadium, and soon, architect George Dahl was hired to design it. This new project was yet another attempt to attract the Olympics to D.C., and with its budget approved, groundbreaking finally began on July 8, 1960. After a little over a year of construction, the District of Columbia Stadium had finally opened after decades of proposals, concepts, and failed attempts. Some finishing touches of construction were still going on, and parts of the facility were closed. But still, the first official event to take place at the stadium was an NFL football game with the president in attendance. However, once total construction officially wrapped up, the stadium held their first MLB baseball game in April 1962. This was the first major game to be held in the stadium, with President John F. Kennedy throwing the first pitch. For being designed in the late 1950s, you'll probably notice that the stadium is quite modern looking. In fact, this stadium was the first major American venue to feature a circular grandstand, one that wrapped all the way around the field below. And that field was dual purpose, able to accommodate both NFL and MLB games, as well as other sporting events and concerts. It was another first in North America. Overall, it was a modern and truly revolutionary design that would be copied elsewhere in the country. In fact, this design was largely built in a similar form at many other stadiums for the next few decades. But at the time, the DC Stadium was still something very unique, and so futuristic for the iconic streets of Washington just meters away. But it also adopted the design trends of the 50s and 60s, with its massive asphalt parking lots surrounding it. It sort of made the stadium stand out more across the dense and meticulously planned streets of DC. It was no doubt a staple of the city, though. Its massive capacity made regular games huge spectacles. And from its opening, the Washington Redskins, the Washington Senators, and the George Washington Colonials became the first primary tenants for the venue. And for the next few years, the stadium continued to host games. However, following the assassination and death of U.S. Senator Robert F. Kennedy, it was decided that the stadium's name should be changed to honor him. So the D.C. Stadium was renamed to the Robert F. Kennedy Memorial Stadium, or RFK Stadium for short. Over the next couple of decades, some teams would depart from their home venue, the Washington Senators being the first to do so in 1971. Attempts to bring back the MLB didn't exactly work out as they tried to get the San Diego Padres to come to DC. 
With that attempt to bust, soccer was then thought to be the next big thing, with the Washington Federals setting up a tendency for a short period. That came right along with the 1980 Soccer Bowl being held there. But really, RFK Stadium was known as the home of the Redskins. Fans would pack the 56,000 seats and absolutely shake the building. It was THE local sporting event to witness, and through the 70s, 80s, and early 90s, RFK was a hot ticketed event in the area, seeing their home team play through three Super Bowl championship series. With such a massive venue in one of the most visited cities in America, RFK also played host to a number of massive events. The Beatles performed their last concert in DC there through the mid-60s, and later the Rolling Stones, the Beach Boys, and the Jackson 5 all played here through the 1970s. Bruce Springsteen, Pink Floyd, The Who, Paul McCartney, and many more continued on into the early 90s. By 1994, the stadium hosted one of the matches for the World Cup beating the all-time record for the most tickets sold at the venue, cramming more than 58,000 people inside the facility. Two years later, the Summer Olympics held a game there too. But 1986 also marked the end for the long-term football team tenant, the Redskins. Their owner brought them to the newly opened Jack Kent Cook Stadium in Maryland, which would later be known as the FedEx Field. This meant that DC and the RFK Stadium were now without a football team. The only tenant left was DC United, part of the Major League Soccer. Washington Freedom, a team from the Women's United Soccer Association, would join them, but only for a short period of time. Really, massive sporting events at RFK had slowed to a crawl, and attendance for the soccer matches never really brought out the same massive and enthusiastic crowds. Even on the music event side of things, well, it was also slowing down. 2001's United We Stand, which was a charity concert put on after 9-11 and featured a number of artists like Michael Jackson, was the last big event. Following that, RFK wouldn't really host another major concert, just a few festivals here and there. Officials at the stadium were scrambling to find a new tenant to occupy the stadium, one that could hopefully garner the same crowds that the Redskins once could. Ultimately, they did succeed with the return of MLB, bringing in the Washington Nationals. President George W. Bush attended this event, throwing the first pitch, and it seemed like RFK might be on the right track once again. However, the return of MLB wasn't as it seemed. The Washington Nationals were tenants of RFK, but only for a limited time, as they were waiting for their new and permanent stadium to be built two miles away. Once it was completed in 2008, the team vacated the facility and made the move. This left DC United and the smaller Military Bowl, part of the NCAA, as the only remaining tenants. By now, the appearance of the stadium was looking a bit tired. Paint was peeling across the facade, one which hadn't been updated since the early 1960s. There were also infrastructure problems, with some critical systems not being properly maintained and this caused power outages during major events. There were also design issues that just couldn't be ignored. While the stadium was a trailblazer and was innovative for its time, able to host both NFL and MLB games, the viewing angles from the grandstands had been sacrificed. No matter what field format they were in, either the top deck or the bottom deck had unfavorable views. So over the last few decades, attendance was down, and rarely there was an event that had a sold out crowd. It didn't help that the National Park Stadium was now open, and by 2018, Audi Field, a soccer stadium, had opened up, also around two miles away. This facility was built for DC United, which meant they would also be leaving RFK. This was the last tenant the facility had, and for many, it marked the beginning of the end. By this point, any other events being held in the stadium were far and few between all while the maintenance began to slip even further. The stadium was basically bringing in little to no money, and officials were quiet about any potential plans to turn the property around. So everyone began assuming the worst. It didn't help that yearly maintenance costs were coming in at $2 million, with another $1.5 million spent a year on utilities. Without a home team tenant and little interest for major events there, RFK was a depreciating asset, and it seemed as though officials had little interest in updating the structure. They instead chose the other option. 
In September of 2019, Events DC, the operator of the stadium, had announced their plans to completely demolish the structure by 2021, all at the cost of $20 million. Until then, the stadium would sit abandoned and completely disused. While a contractor was chosen by the next year, progress was pretty slow on demolition. This was all while the condition within the structure had begun to deteriorate. Brian and Michael from The Proper People documented the state of the building, which by this point had been sitting vacant and abandoned for years. The power remained on and security was on site. However, a chain-link fence now bordered the massive property. Behind it was a visibly decaying stadium, with paint peeling off and the rusty superstructure peeking through. The concrete was weather-worn as weeds populated the parking lots. Inside, the stadium was a ghostly shell of its former self. A shocking state that's really representative on how far it's fallen. And it is hard to imagine this place as the same stadium where the Beatles played to tens of thousands of people and several presidents across recent history sitting in the grandstands. The skyboxes were now filled with cobwebs and the center field overtaken by weeds. It's certainly no Pontiac Silverdome, but it was a sad sight for many who remember the vibrant and eye-catching facility it once was. What was most striking about the property, though, was its incredible location, just a mile and a half away from the nation's most iconic structures. RFK's design was supposed to be a symbol of America's modern architecture, a beacon of what engineering minds can do, especially during the infrastructure optimism through the 1950s. Washington has always been a little bit about showing off, and the RFK Stadium was part of it. It's perfectly framed coming across the Whitney Young Memorial Bridge, and at the very end of Capitol Street. So having an abandoned 50,000 seat stadium was pretty jarring. Progress on the demolition was moving along though, albeit very slowly as the hazardous materials including asbestos needed to be carefully extracted. The 2021 demolition date came and went with no significant work. But that all changed in late 2022, when Events DC began liquidating some of the interiors, mainly the seats sold to private individuals as memorabilia, priced between $350 to $500. By December, the owners went even further. Those who had requested special items from the stadium, like elevator panels and air ducts, had actually received them. You know what, that's actually really cool of them to do. And in the same month, the final orange seats had been removed during a press conference. This marked the beginning of major demolition work. Through early 2023, work began removing all non-structural debris and plastics from the building. By the end of 2023, the entirety of RFK Stadium is scheduled for complete demolition, ending the building's 62-year-long life. That 62-year-long career was something special for a lot of people. Millions of fans from all over packed the grandstands, literally shaking them with their sheer enthusiasm. Many described it as a sense of community, a massive gathering for one uniting interest. A lot of people remember their time at RFK fondly, and between its innovative design and iconic events, it is a historic structure. But it's also one that never garnered the same amount of attention by big sports teams. Once the Redskins left, it struggled to keep a permanent mainstream tenant. Despite its prominent location, other new and better designed stadiums opened up, built for the teams that essentially used RFK as a temporary home. Those new stadiums also attracted the large events in DC. That left a massive and somewhat redundant structure from a different time. It had equally massive upkeep bills, and with little interest to keep it around, the decision was to ultimately tear it down and figure out a new use. At this point, there really isn't a concrete plan on what will replace it. Some have suggested a large gateway park, while others have considered a new stadium for the commanders. Whatever it might be, the District of Columbia will be in a unique position to have almost 100 acres of cleared land at the eastern end of downtown. So perhaps, instead of repeating the past, which has turned out to be a disposable structure, It'll be interesting to see if the district actually puts this land to good use.
You might have noticed that Brightson Films has seen a bit of a refresh with the logos, typeface, and colors. It's something I started working on a while ago, but it all began legitimately on Skillshare. Skillshare is the perfect place to explore your creativity and learn new things. I was personally watching Diudi's various courses on design, as well as Adam Treby's course on color theory and applications. This was incredibly helpful when I began talking with an artist on what we wanted to do. My new big goal is to create a website for Brightsome Films, and as someone who knows absolutely nothing about web design, it is a bit of a daunting task. But once again, Skillshare has a bunch of easy to understand courses. I've been watching Dennis Field's introduction of web design essentials, and it's super helpful. So if you want to try Skillshare out for yourself and see what you can discover, the first 1,000 people to use my special link in the description below will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. Anyway guys, my name is Jake, and thank you very much for watching.